Friends, this is Rick Renner, and here I am with my team standing on the probable ruins of the authentic Noah's Ark. You say, Rick, how could you be on the ruins of Noah's Ark? Isn't it supposed to be on the very peak of Mount Ararat? Well, the peak of Mount Ararat is directly behind me today. It's covered by clouds. What does the Bible say about the real location of Noah's Ark today? The Bible says it landed in the mountain range of Ararat, and this particular ship formation is in the mountain range of Ararat. And scientists and researchers have been coming here since 1959, and major, major media, including the History Channel, the Science Channel, they have all been here, and all kinds of scans have been conducted here. And my friends, this is not a natural object. This is a man-made object that exactly fits the dimensions which are given to us in the Bible. So what does the Bible really tell us about the location of Noah's Ark. That's what we're going to see today. It's going to be great. So stay with me. Well, here I am seated on the possible remains of Noah's Ark, but I don't believe it's possible. I'm convinced these really are the collapsed ruins of Noah's Ark. They precisely fit the dimensions which are given to us in scripture. And from 1959 to the present, scan after scan after scan, ground penetrating radar, ERT scans with 39 different scans have really examined this site and has revealed this is a man-made object. And below me, there are decks, there are rooms. And if you look behind me, you will see the peak or the bow of the ship. But what does the Bible actually tell us about where we should find Noah's Ark? Well, just behind the cameraman, right in front of me, I'm looking right at the very peak of the Mount Ararat. And people have been climbing Mount Ararat for years and years, trying to find Noah's Ark. But what does the Bible say about where the ark landed? And the answer is in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4. The Bible says, And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. The mountains of Ararat were an entire mountain range. The mountain that people have been climbing, which is called Mount Ararat, the single mountain, is a stratovolcano. It was much, much smaller when the flood took place. It's had many, many eruptions since. And my friends, even if the ark had landed there, they would never be able to find it because it would be covered with lava. But my friends, the Bible does not say that it landed on the peak of the one single Mount Ararat, but in the mountain range of Ararat, and that is what this is. In fact, this is precisely where the Bible said that the ark landed. But it really didn't land at this exact spot, but on the mountain behind me. And over thousands of years, it has moved down the hill in an earth slide or a mud slide until finally it's come to rest at this location. But today we're gonna dive deep into the Bible and we're going to see exactly what the Bible says about where we should find the location of Noah's Ark. It's gonna be good. So stay with me today all the way to the end of the program. Welcome to today's program, my friend. This is Rick Renner. I've been waiting for you, and I hope that you've been waiting for me. And today we're going to return to our series, which is called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters on the World Before the Flood. And today we're going to see what the Bible tells us and what other historical sources tell us about the real location of Noah's Ark and dear friends, as I showed you in the introduction to today's program, I've been there. I have seen the ruins of Noah's Ark. This is not mythology. It is not a fantasy. My friends, Noah's Ark is the real deal. This event really took place. I have been there. I've walked all over it. And today I'm going to tell you where is the real location of Noah's Ark. But this is just one little piece in this 15-part series and friend, I really want you to have this series. It will enrich your knowledge, 
your understanding of the Bible and your spiritual life. And it comes with a study guide. And my friend, the study guide's enormous. I put so much work into this study guide and I want you to have it so you can read it while you're seeing or hearing the whole series. And we're also offering you right now a book by Dr. Dennis Lindsay. It's the book that I wish I had written. I, yeah, yeah, this book is amazing. I read it in one sitting. You probably will too. Believe me, it'll challenge you. It'll make you think outside the box. The name of the book is Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. And the bottom of the book says, Ancient Secrets to Prepare You for the Coming Days. The back of the book says, Are Aliens Really fallen angels. Who are the Nephilim and are they returning to the earth? My friends, this book is amazing and I want you to have it. But you can order this, you can order the series and the study guide and everything else which we offer you at our website or you can just call us to place your order right now and we'll get it right to you. But my friend, when you reach out to us, would you please let us know how to pray for you? I'm not being trite when I say that. I really mean it from my heart when I tell you that one of the greatest privileges God has given to us is to get your email or to answer your call where we can begin to put our faith together with you for whatever it is that's bothering you or that you have need of right now. Jesus said, if two or three of you will agree as touching anything, I'll do it. And we know how to get into agreement and we know how to pray the prayer of faith. And if you'll reach out to us, by calling that number right now or by sending us an email, we'll release our faith, get into agreement with you, and we know Jesus is going to do something tremendous for you. Say amen. Ah, but hey, reach for your Bible. We always use the Bible in this program. And today we're going to see where is the location of Noah's Ark. This is going to be amazing. So let's go to Genesis chapter 7 and verse 6. And in Genesis chapter 7, verse 6, the Bible says, and Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. He began building the ark when he was 500. So he built the ark for 100 years, and for 100 years he preached and gave people an opportunity to repent. But then you come to Genesis chapter 7, verse 7, and it says, And Noah went in, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Verse 8 of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. Then verse 9, Then went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, and male and female, as God commanded Noah. Verse 10, And it came to pass after seven days, after seven days, that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. I want to tell you what ancient rabbis say. Ancient rabbis say that at first, the waters begin to fall very gently to give people the reality that the flood was really coming and to give them more time to repent even at a last minute. But when they refused to repent, then the torrent was released upon the earth. And that's what we read in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And here in this verse, we find that the water came from below the crust of the earth and the rain came from the heavens through the window of heaven. And that is the first mention of the window of heaven in scripture. The window of heaven is a portal through which abundance comes. We see that here because when the windows of heaven opened, rain began to pour and pour and pour and pour. It was torrential rain came through this portal called the windows of heaven. Keep that in mind because when you come to the book of Malachi chapter 3, it says that if you bring all the tithe into the storehouse, God will open for you the windows of heaven and God will give you so much prosperity and blessing that you will not have room enough to receive it. Well, to understand that window of heaven, you got to go back to this window of heaven because that's the first time that window shows up in the Bible. When the window of heaven opens in Genesis chapter 7, rain pours and pours and pours and pours. But in Malachi chapter 3, when you give your finances 
and you obey God, your finances are like the key to that window that opens the window of heaven. And just like rain poured through that filled the earth, God's blessing pours through that portal until you will not have room enough to receive it. That's important for you to understand about the window of heaven. But when you come to Genesis 7, verse 12, it says, And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So rain poured torrentially for 40 days and 40 nights, and from below the crust of the earth, water poured forth into the planet for 40 days and 40 nights. And finally, Genesis 7, 13 says, In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Jephthah, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons into the ark. Verse 14, They and every living beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. Verse 15, And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. Verse 16, and they that went in were male and female of all flesh as God commanded him and the Lord shut him in. There was only one door and God himself shut them in. My friends, remember that the ark is a type of Christ. And when you're in Christ, you enter into Christ and you are permanently sealed in Christ, which means even if the world is filled with destruction all around us because God has put us permanently in Christ, we will float on the waters of destruction safe in the person of Jesus Christ. Say amen. And if you're not a Christian, that's a good reason for you to become a Christian today. God will seal you safely into the person of Jesus Christ. But once in the ark... God himself shut the door and Noah and his family were safely kept inside beyond the reach of destruction. And then we read in verse 17, and the flood was 40 days upon the earth and the waters increased and bear up the ark and it was lift up above the earth. They literally floated on the waters of destruction, which is what we can do if we are in Christ. Verse 18, and the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters, verse 19. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered, which means this was a global event. Verse 20, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. That means the flood reached approximately 25 feet above the highest mountains of the earth. Verse 21, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. Verse 22, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life and of all that was on the dry land died. Verse 23, and every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping thing and the fowl of heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they which were with him in the ark. Verse 24, and the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days, which is approximately five months. Chapter 8, verse 1, and God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assudged, or the waters began to decrease. Verse 2, the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heavens were restrained. Verse 3, and the waters returned from off the earth continually and after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. The word abated means they were in the process of decreasing. Verse 4, listen to this. Where is the ark located? Here's the answer. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. It does not say on the peak of Mount Ararat because Mount Ararat, as we know it today, likely didn't even exist at that time. It's a stratovolcano. Even if it did exist, it was much, much smaller at that time. This verse explicitly says that the ark landed upon the mountains of Ararat. So let me give you a geography lesson. Ararat is not a single mountain, but it is an entire mountain range. 
The entire region later became known as the Uratu Kingdom. And this is very, very important because Lower Uratu is allegedly where the Garden of Eden was. I just think that is amazing because it means God took Noah and his family back to the starting place. He went back to the very place where allegedly the Garden of Eden was first located and said, hey, man has messed up, so let's go back to the starting place and start all over again. It would be just like God to do that. And in that same location is where God repeated the very words which he had said to Adam. Now he repeated them to Noah. He said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. God took Noah back to the starting place and said, now let's start all over. And that's what God will do with you. If you feel like you've made a mess out of things, if not hopeless, God in his goodness will take you back to the starting place to enable you to start all over again. But this mountain range was also connected to a lower mountain called Judy. And this is very important. It is a lower mountain in the mountain range of the Ararat Mountains and other additional ancient writings state that the ark came to rest on a mountain called Judy. It really is recorded in ancient writings, and it says that the ark landed at an elevation of about 7,400 feet, also near the Silk Road, also near the border of Iran. The name Judy, the name of this mountain, means the place of the landing, which means they named this mountain in memory of the fact that this is where the ark landed. The word Judy means the place of the landing. And in Genesis chapter 10, verse 30, it says the very first city after the flood was called Mesha. And the city of Mesha, the first post-flood city, was built by Noah and his survivors. The word Mesha means drawn out of water. It was the name given to him to it by Noah and by his survivors. And they probably built it with some of the materials that remained from the flood. And what is amazing is the slope and the cliff just to the side above where the ruins of the ark today rest is called Mishur, the modern name, which is a derivative of the biblical name, Misha. I think that is amazing. And in that site, way up on the top of the slope next to the cliffs, there are about a thousand dwellings that remain from ancient, ancient times. And many people believe that those are the ruins of Misha, which is identified in the Bible in Genesis chapter 10, verse 30. But eventually the ark began to move down the side of the mountain. And the reason it began to slide down the side of the mountain is because the entire side of that mountain is a mudslide. I have been there and I'm telling you, it's mud from the top all the way to the bottom. And even at this moment, every spring after the winter, that mud begins to move. The whole mountainside moves except for a ship-shaped formation in the very middle of it whose dimensions, whose formation never changes, even though everything around it changes. That 515 long ship-shaped formation are the ruins of Noah's Ark. And the shape of that ship is a classical ancient ship. Ancient ships were referred to in three measurements. Listen to this. First was the length which is a hard number and an actual measurement and length. Secondly was the width. And the width always referred to the average width of the ship at the mid part of the ship. This figure is always an average of width. Number three was the height dimension, which includes the hull and the superstructure. And the dimensions of the ship-shaped formation on the slopes of Mount Judy right next to Misha exactly fit the measurements and the dimensions which are given to us in the Bible. That is just amazing to me. And according to the ancient writings of Berossus, a Chaldean priest from the third century, I quoted him in the last program. It states that when the flood was finished, the ark rested on a mountain which later came to be called Judy because it was the place of the landing. Wow, is that amazing? Now, why would it be impossible for the ark to land on the peak 
of Mount Ararat? I want to answer that question, and I want to say again that Mount Ararat itself is a stratovolcano, and it has erupted many, many times since the time of the flood, and if the ark had been on the peak of what today is called Mount Ararat, it would have been blown to bits, or it would have been covered with lava, and not only that, it is so high where some people speculate the ark is, you can't even get there today without special equipment and the use of oxygen, which means the ancient people who wrote about going there would have had to have special equipment and oxygen to get there, and it didn't exist at that time. My friends, it's just a legend that landed on the peak of Ararat, and the Bible doesn't even say that. It says it landed in the mountains of Ararat in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4. And today in eastern Turkey, in the lower mountains of Ararat, are the ruins, and what I really believe are the ruins of Noah's Ark. And though it is greatly deteriorated, it is visible that it really is a massive, massive ship. I've walked all over it. I've measured it from one end to the other. And as I told you in the last program, not only that massive drogue stones are scattered throughout the valley below, these were stones used to balance the ship as it sailed through bad weather and as the ship began to slow and get ready for landing, Noah began to cut those stones. And if you follow the drogue stones, you can follow the path of the ship as it turned and sailed right into what was later called Mount Judy in the lower mountains of Ararat. But now listen to this. In Genesis 6.16, God instructed Noah to build an ark 300 cubits in length. And the ship in the lower mountains of Ararat today is exactly that. It is 515 feet in length. In Genesis 6.16, God instructed Noah to build the ark 50 cubits in width. And today the ship in the lower mountains of Ararat is approximately that. It is 85 feet in width. In Genesis 6, 16, God instructed Noah to build the ark 30 cubits high. And today the ship in the lower mountains of Ararat is approximately that. It is 50 feet in length. And in Genesis 6, 14, God instructed Noah to make many rooms inside the ark. And scans show that formation in the lower mountains of Ararat has multiple rooms. And in Genesis 6, 16, God instructed Noah to make the ark with three stories inside. And scans show that the ark in the lower mountains of Ararat exactly has has three stories. Like I've told you, it slid about 1,200 feet down from where it first landed. And today you can go there and you can visit it in the lower mountains of Ararat if you have the money and the courage to go there. But in Genesis 8, 5, the Bible says the waters decrease continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month of the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen. Then verse 6 says, And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he looked out to see what remained after the flood, and he saw an amazing sight. And that's what we're going to cover in the next program when we look at the exit from Noah's ark. I'll be back in just a moment, and I want to pray for you. Finally, Rick Renner has unlocked the mystery surrounding the sons of God and the giants that appeared in the earth before the flood during the days of Noah. To film this riveting series, Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood, Rick and his team traveled to eastern Turkey to the ruins of Noah's Ark. In this series, Rick dives deep into the scriptures to give you answers about who are the sons of God in Genesis 6, 1 and 2? What does the promise of 120 years really mean? Where is the real location of Noah's Ark today? Rick says, this is the series I've wanted to teach for decades. With the research we conducted at the real Noah's Ark, along with amazing historical records, I believe this long-awaited series will answer a multitude of questions for people who have wondered about the strange events that occurred before the flood and what Jesus said about them being repeated at the end of the age. This 15-part series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $24. In addition, we're offering Dennis Lindsay's astounding book, Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. This book will amaze you and open your mind to mysteries hidden in the Bible that have great impact on our world today. This book can be yours for $20. Don't delay. Order this bundle of the 15-part series, Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood, and the book, Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. 
Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and I'm standing outside the new TV studio in Moscow. Praise God, most of the interior is already finished. They're still working on Denise's studio, so pray for us as we continue, it's gonna be nice. And if you see the big bulldozer behind me, that's because they're getting ready to do the parking lot. You know, winter comes pretty early in our part of the world, so we need to really seize the moment and get this parking done before the cold weather sets in. But hey, we're making progress and praise God, the studio is paid for. This is all paid for. And I wanna say thank you for being the most amazing partners and helping us with this. And now the project in front of us is to pay off the Tulsa facility. We want to retire the debt on the big office complex in Tulsa because when that's paid off, suddenly all those finances are gonna be released for us to go on more TV and minister to people all over the world. My friends, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, 21, that the lips of the righteous feed many. I know that's my assignment, to feed as many people the Word of God as possible, and I'm doing it with you. Wow, thank you for being a partner. You're part of the giving team that's helping us make amazing progress. And if you're not a part of the giving team yet, please pray about joining us to retire the debt on the Tulsa building. It's not about buildings. It's just about having the space we need so that we can effectively minister to people. We want to retire that debt so we can take the Word of God to more parts of the world where people are crying out for teaching they can trust. And I want to say thank you for everything you do. My friend, today we've covered so much information. I know you cannot possibly remember everything in this series. So please order the whole series, which is 15 parts, Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood, and the study guide that goes with it. And please also order Dr. Dennis Lindsay's book, which is called Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. And when you reach out to us, please also let us know how to pray for you. And I want to pray for you right now. Today in the program, I said that God will give you a fresh start if you've messed up. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to give my friend a fresh start, to start all over again with the power of God and to do things right in Jesus' mighty name. And I thank you for your mercy and your grace to help us to do that. Amen. Well, I'll see you in the next program where we're going to see the exit from the ark. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.